That beautiful song was written by Charles Wesley. Did you know that? It's beautiful if you ever get a chance to look at the words. But one of the, the things it says is deep desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. And so as we start this Surprise by Hope series, we're, we're really doing this because we believe that, that right across this planet, throughout this world, people we come into contact with every day are looking for real and lasting hope. And so we want to talk about what that looks like <laughs> as we unpack the Christmas story. Do you know, I went to uh, order some chicken and chips for my family a couple of years ago, and I was in a, in a, uh, a shop sort of fairly near to here. Some of you may frequent it. I won't mention it by name. But I was in there, and uh, i just come from church on Sunday, and there was a lady behind the counter, and she looks at me, and she just says, Why are you so happy? And I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I didn't know I was wrong to be happy. So obviously there was something in my face, smile, I don't know, peace or joy of God there that she connected with, connected with. <laughs> and I was like, do you really want to know? I thought, really, I could launch straight in here, but there's all these people around there. So I just said, oh, it's just, you know, it's great to be alive. I've just come from church. It's... I didn't know it was a crime to be happy. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> But if you had anyone ever ask you, why do you hope in Jesus? They might not have specifically used those words, but there's a curiosity, there's a, there's a, they're perplexed, there's, there's a, there's a wondering, there's a, I see something in you that's different. They might have said to you, how did you become a Christ follower? Have you always been so religious? (laughs) Why are you always so peaceful? They might have said to you, do you know, we're talking about, you know, or with you've been facing things where you're talking about your health and you're not afraid of death. Why is that? We live in a world that is starving for real and lasting hope. Sometimes we mistakenly assume that most people we come across aren't interested in Christianity. And some might say they're not. It could be because of preconceived ideas about church or the Bible or painful experiences of suffering that they just can't make sense of. An increasing number of people might even believe the lie that's influencing our popular culture, that the Christian faith is restrictive, it's outdated, it's irrelevant, and to some, it's even dangerous to human freedom. That's a lie that's being permeated in our culture. But all of us are desperately hungry for spiritual encounters that have real meaning and lasting hope. And so whether people know it or not, many people are actually interested in genuine Christian faith. Because under all the pretense of self-sufficiency and deciding what we think is best for our lives, we all crave purpose and meaning. We all crave peace that's beyond understanding. We all crave... uh, Uh, an awareness that, an assurance that our sins are forgiven. We all crave a freedom to live for something that's greater than our own ego, our own self-interest. We all crave lasting contentment without attachment to earthly things. We all crave eternal life or to know what's going to happen when this life comes to an end. You know, we all crave the wonderful, unconditional love of God that cannot be fully explained, cannot be fully understood with our minds, but can be experienced. We can only experience these in relationship with Jesus. And what we deeply long for, but perhaps cannot fully articulate, in our humanity right across this planet is available to each one of us in Christ. And so I don't know about you, but whenever I think about my own story, how I grew up in a Christian home and lived on a farm until I was nine and we moved to Adelaide and then when we got to Adelaide, a couple of years later I experienced a real trauma in my life because my mum, who was struggling with clinical depression, took her own life. And so I, throughout my teenage years, I really had a deep sense of loneliness, a deep sense of um, feeling alone and unresolved grief. And so when I hit 18 and my parents gave me a Bible and said, look, you can choose for yourself what you believe. We go to church and now you're 18, you need to decide for yourself. I said, thank you very much. I put the Bible under my bed to collect dust and started to sleep in on Sunday mornings and said, I'm not really interested. 
And then I went to uni and at, my, at the uni course where I was doing, I had about four Christian friends, women who, young adults who I started to see for the first time were living out their Christian faith. And I thought, wow, there's young people who actually want to follow Jesus, who actually want to be Christians. And so the beginning of 1999, I prayed a prayer and I said, God, if you're real, show me. And I dusted off that Bible from under my bed and opened it up and started to read some of the scriptures. And as I read them, they were so personal. It was like they were jumping out off the page to me. Until Easter that year, one of my friends invited me along to the Easter Passion Play. And I came along. I remember I was sitting right in the middle. <laughs> and I heard really clearly, I can't remember everything was, that was said, but I heard and I sensed Jesus' love for me like I'd never sensed before. And I knew that though I'd be looking for love in all the wrong places, that He was the love that I was craving. And I wanted Him in my life. And so I gave, no one would have known, only me and God. But I prayed a prayer and invited Him to come into my life. And I've been following Him for 20 years and I've just seen Jesus be so faithful in my life through the ups and the downs, through the goods and the bads, you know, to give me uh, confidence to use my gifts to help and heal and put me back together. I'm not perfect, but helping me heal and put me back together with all this stuff that's happened in my life. And uh, to be honest, I'd actually be dead without Jesus, I think. It's only because of His grace and His faithfulness but I have a story like this. In 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Christianity, Christian faith, followers of Christ, we have a hope. We have a hope, the hope that we have. The sovereign Lord who came to earth, he came down, 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 and he entered our dirty, our messy and broken humanity because he knew we could not save ourselves or make ourselves good enough for a holy God. And these words from, this, from the song, King of Kings by Hillsong Church, just so move me when I hear them. I'm going to read them to us today. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word, to reveal the kingdom coming. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt, to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering you saw to the other side, Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. Jesus, for our sake, you died. Jesus, for my sake, you died. Jesus, for your sake, he died. That verse says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. They might not ask you with words. They might not ask you with, why do you trust in Jesus? But they're asking as they look at your life. They're asking for a reason to hope. And reflecting deeply on the fact that it was the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings who for our sake died, who descended into darkness to rescue us up out of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of his son, the kingdom of light, <laughs> to make it possible for us to have relationship with our heavenly father that inspires deep, deep worship and reverence. And as the more we reflect on it, the more we think about it, it actually, it actually propels us and compels us. It softens our heart. It propels us and compels us to open our mouth, to share of this good news. That it's not just good advice, it's good news. The more our hearts are wanting to want to extend the kindness and compassion of Jesus, as we just reflect on how magnificent a hope we have, how wonderful a hope we have, how, how significant, how beyond comprehension the hope that we have. We can't wrap our heads around it, but we can experience it. It's so wonderful. In Ephesians 2, it says, Remember what you were in the past. At that time, you were apart from Christ. You lived in this world without hope and without God. And if there's ever a description that talks about people's state without Christ, it's without hope and without God. 
And if that doesn't move you, it moves me so deeply to think that there's people who are living without hope and without God. And I think we have the hope. We have the hope. We have it. This great, wonderful, amazing hope that we have within us. He wants us to be always prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have. A few, about a week and a half ago, I was at a family function and someone I'd never met before just started talking to me and opening up and sharing their story, (laughs) pouring out their pain. And while she's talking to me, I'm thinking, God, give me something. Give me an open door. Help me here. Help me now. (laughs) Do you know you can pray to Jesus when you're having one of those conversations? Help her to see Jesus in my eyes. Give me an open door. I'm praying these kind of things. I didn't want to force anything, but I'm praying. I'm like, God, help me. And then it happened. She starts talking about her granddad who's got faith, who had faith in Christ and how he was such a positive impact in her life. And I went, God, you're so beautiful. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) So I just was able to share with her and say, well, I think the prayers that your granddad prayed over you, you know, the things that he would love for you, the things that God has for you, his calls on your life. You know, you live in Ranella. We've got a fantastic church in Ranella. You should go check it out. You should go back to church. And so I start talking to her. Like, and I'm just thinking, God, you opened that opportunity. It was amazing. Surprised by hope. <laughs> the hope that we have is magnificent, and we can often and continually be surprised by hope. Those King of Kings lyrics continue, and the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. Jesus, described here as the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sin of the world, he is actually risen. He's alive. You're allowed to be excited about that. You're allowed to say hallelujah, that's great, praise the Lord, amen. Come on. (laughs) And he wants to bring clarity about the hope that we already have, the hope that is available in him. He wants to end confusion. I feel like there's some people here like confusion and and a cloud of cluttering your hope has rolled on in like a fog and the Lord wants to lift that from your life today. He wants to end confusion and give you clarity about the hope that you have because he can lift discouragement or despair. He can break into your thinking and shift paradigms. He can intervene in your circumstances and relationships and he can infuse your heart with hope today. There are many things that can cloud or clutter the reason for our hope. Busyness, family dynamics or relationship issues, especially during the Christmas season, there can be pain around that. Ongoing health issues, unresolved grief, insecurity, fear of missing out, fear of what other people think, offence and unforgiveness. All these things can cloud and clutter our hope can keep you just focusing, putting one foot in front of the other, looking down instead of looking up to what God's done for us in Christ. It can draw, help cause you to draw back instead of pressing forward in faith. It can agitate you to react to immediate things, natural things in front of you, even to decide on a course of action that seems right, but it's actually not God's plan for your life. Which brings me to the very first Christmas. Have you ever wondered the thoughts and the pressures that were trying to cloud Joseph of Nazareth's hope? There would have been a lot. If you've ever flipped from the last page of the Old Testament to the first page of the New Testament, you've just skipped 400 years of history with a single page turn. And in that time, there was no prophet, there was no prophetic voice to God's people. He was, God was seemingly silent. 400 years, that takes, if that was now, that would take us back to the 1600s. After some 400 years of silent waiting, God suddenly broke the silence through not a prophet but an angel, a messenger of good news, a herald of what was to come. And in the Gospel of Luke, the angel Gabriel first appears to a priest named Zechariah foretelling the birth of John the Baptist, who would be born to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Next, God sends the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married 
to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So Elizabeth was six months pregnant and rejoicing. Zechariah couldn't speak. If you don't know why, you've got to go and read Luke chapter 1. Um, now the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, this teenage girl living in the back sticks of, uh, of Nazareth, a place most Jewish people don't expect too much good to come from. And to say Mary was surprised would be an understatement. The angel tells Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a saviour. He's the promised Messiah. He's the king. And she says, hello, I know how babies are made. (laughs) How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called Son of God. For no word from God will ever fail. That's for some of you this morning. For no word of God will ever fail. For no word, no word of God will ever fail. Mary's response is amazing. She says, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. But there's no record of her having a little chat with Joseph. (laughs) Can you imagine what that conversation would have been like? Highly awkward, probably quite intense. (laughs) <laughs> straight after it's, it seems in the scripture that straight after the angel appears to her she bundles all her stuff together and goes off to stay with her relative Elizabeth stays there for three months and then the next time we hear about Mary and Joseph in Luke is the fact that she's, they're travelling to, uh, to Bethlehem <laughs> to register for the census so there must have been a conversation that happened in there somehow <laughs> She was betrothed to to Joseph. Now, betrothal is different to engagement that we know of these days. Betrothal is like a 12-month binding um, covenant or contract that people entered into. It's like step one of marriage. After 12 months, step two happened where a husband and wife would come together and consummate their marriage and live together. And you could only get out of a betrothal by divorce. We need to go to Matthew's gospel to see how Joseph processed the news that Mary was pregnant. Matthew 1 says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah, the long-awaited one that we just heard about in that video, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. So somewhere in there, the Bible doesn't say when, but Mary must have had a convo with Joseph. We need to have a chat. (laughs) Or maybe he notices a growing bump in her body. I don't know. It doesn't make sense to Joseph. Who ever heard of the Holy Spirit conceiving a baby in a virgin's body? As if God would condescend to come and live in a teenage girl from Nazareth. Joseph cared for Mary and maybe even loved her, but surely this was delusional. Delusional. He knew he wasn't the father, so he's thinking for her to be pregnant with another man's child when she was betrothed to Joseph, it just didn't make sense to him. And it would have exposed Mary to public disgrace. The Jewish custom at the time allowed for Joseph to publicly stone Mary for her unfaithfulness. Matthew 1, 19 says, Because Joseph, her husband, her betrothed husband, was faithful to the law, was a righteous man, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, you see, God, Joseph couldn't see God at work. <laughs> his hope was clouded by his own natural thinking, his own natural log- logical analysis of the situation. He was most likely heartbroken that Mary had been unfaithful to him or that another man had taken advantage of her. He would have been afraid, <laughs> afraid of what other people think, afraid of what was going to happen to Mary. And he knew the promised Messiah was meant to come. I just think he couldn't understand how God would choose to do it this way with a teenage girl from Nazareth. 
pregnant by the Holy Spirit. A baby to come into the world was to be the long-awaited Messiah. It seemed so messy, so fragile, and so improbable. So after considering all his options, he worked out a plan that would cause the least collateral damage. And it's just like I have this picture of Joseph just like quietly just backing out of Mary's life and any association with Mary. (laughs) And then he went to sleep. And isn't it just like God that he broke into Joseph's life with a dream? He surprised him. He surprised him with hope for his life and with the news about the hope for all the world. God broke into his life and completely upended his world, turned it upside down with hope. And he's here today to do that in our lives. In Matthew 1.20, it goes on to say, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah, actually. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph, son of David, the angel reminds him of his identity. And this morning is God reminding you of your identity in Christ, that you've been adopted as a son or daughter of the Most High God that will never change, that cannot be snatched from your hand because you belong to Jesus. The angel said, do not be afraid. I'm in this, God's saying. Don't draw back or rely on your own understanding. Trust me. Is he saying that to you this morning? Don't rely on your own natural analysis. Seek my wisdom. You can trust me. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge me and I will make your paths straight. Is he saying that to you? Trust me this morning. What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. It's like God saying, this is my doing. My thoughts and ways are higher than your thoughts and your ways. Is he saying that to you this morning? She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. In other words, what Mary is saying is true. You are to be his legal father, Joseph. You are to name him on purpose because he is your hope and the hope of all the world. Is God saying to you this morning, the impossibility you see is not an impossibility to him? Is he saying to you and wanting to ignite your faith, to take him at his word and believe that he's spoken to you? Is he birthing something in you? It might be a creative idea, wisdom, a gift of faith, a prompting to step out, a desire to be healed, a passion to pray for your friends and family members who don't know Christ and to believe that God's going to use those prayers and open up opportunity for you to share the love of Jesus. That's from the Holy Spirit. Do you know the reason for our hope. We've talked about the hope that we have. We talked about Joseph being surprised by hope and God surprising the world by bursting in after 400 years with the news of the birth of our Saviour. But the reason for our hope, it's right there in that verse of the angel communicating to Joseph. The reason for our hope is Jesus, God saves. That's what his name means. Jesus means God saves because he will save his people from their sins. Do you know we have forgiveness available to us in Christ? If you've never experienced the assurance of forgiveness, the understanding that Jesus Christ died on a cross and he did it to remove your sins as far as the east is from the west, he actually took your sin, became sin, took it upon himself so that he could remove any barrier between you and a holy God and so that you could know God as your heavenly father. There's forgiveness available to us because God came to rescue us. Jesus is God saves. It's a reason for our hope. 
Jesus is also God with us. <laughs> Matthew quotes that prophecy from Isaiah about Jesus that he will be given the name Emmanuel and that he will be, that, that means God with us. God with us. What are you facing right now where you're believing a lie that you're on your own? If you know Christ, God is with you. He's with you right there in your situation, whether you can feel him or not. He's actually with you. He's come up close and personal. He loves you. He's for you. He's with you. And the third thing which Scripture testifies to is that Jesus is Christ in us. He's He's, he's God saves. He's the one who offers us forgiveness of sins. He's Emmanuel. He's the one whose God is with us, but he's also Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Do you know, two Sundays ago, there was a woman who came to this service and then came to a couple of our Friday services and recommitted her life to Jesus. When she came to this service two weeks ago, the very next day, she passed away. This week, just this week, Pastor Mick Hutchfield took her funeral. She's in the presence of Jesus right now because she came to a place where she could hear the hope that we have in Christ. And her sister, who's not a Christian, came to the funeral. One of our beautiful ladies from our church, Linda Grabenchkoff, has been supporting her, actually found her. And God is using this situation to bring hope to a family. It's amazing. You never know. <laughs> God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles or people who were considered outsiders the glorious riches of this mystery, mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he is the one we proclaim. He is the one we proclaim. 1 Peter, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I want to finish by telling you a story. It's actually a true story. I want to read you someone's story, actually. This story is written by a testimony by a man called David Bennett. He is a passionate apologist for the Christian faith. He studied at Wycliffe Hall, the University of Oxford and the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. This is his story. My journey to faith in Christ was a road studded with valleys and troughs. As a young teenager attending a Christian boys' school in a leafy Sydney suburb, I awoke to the fact that I was attracted exclusively to men. When I came out at the age of 14, I decided to keep my distance from my fundamentalist Christian relatives. I internalised anger towards the Christian world in which I was brought up. I abandoned any positive view of Christianity and as a spiritually hungry teenager, dabbled and experimented with all sorts of new age spirituality. One day, ridden with curiosity, I visited a psychic in Newtown as she read my cards and looked at me, she said I was a child of the light and was destined to be with Jesus. Hilarious. I was furious, he writes. When we moved to our house closer, our house closer to the harbour, he's born in Australia, this guy, I would often look out over our new view, wishing I could escape to Oxford Street and the eastern suburbs where culture had the libertine sophistication I craved. Little did I know I was chasing a ghost that would never fulfil me, a darkness that masqueraded as an angel of light. If it were Rome, I would have worshipped at the altar of Aphrodite or Eros. The predominant message around me was that Eros or sexual love was the highest of the loves and how dare those pious Christians deprive me of the highest form of transcendence possible. To me, agape love was a saccharine dream, not love on the cross. This war of loves truly began when I found out that my mother had become a Christian at a charismatic church on the northern beaches. And I said, and this is what he said to her, believing lies, but he said to her, you must choose between me or the God who hates me. And she said back to him, David, I love God and it helps me 
to be better at loving you. What a great response. (laughs) I decided that after at university, I threw myself into political and creative clubs and joined the queer collective and the Labor left. I would rip down Christian club posters and would stick (coughs) queer collective posters over the top. I decided that after dating so many people, I would stay single for a year, but after my best friend's boyfriend fell in love with me and I reciprocated, I felt dead inside. I felt like David in his situation with Bathsheba, the fatal repercussion being the death of a close friendship. I'd become the cliche cliche secular hypocrite. My broken morality and evil heart trumped my rational ethics every time. At Christmas time, I had a debate with my Christian uncle. There is no absolute truth, I proclaimed over the family Christmas table. To say there is no absolute truth is an absolute truth, my uncle retorted softly. The truth is a person I know, not a static concept in my head. What a beautiful response by his uncle. My postmodern worldview was disarmed and I stormed out. (laughs) Three months later, and he speaks on a video about his uncle specifically feeling after that conversation, God saying to him, in three months, this man's going to come to know Jesus. Three months later, I found myself in the Dolphin Hotel in Surrey Hills and had spotted a young filmmaker from my uni who was a finalist in the Tropfest Short Film Festival. I wanted to interview her in the student magazine. It would be definitely the best story we had all year. As she revealed her faith to me, I pushed back against her talk about God because he said, why did you make the movie? And she said, it was God who led me to make it. Until she asked me one piercing question, David, (laughs) have you ever experienced the love of God? She said to him. I didn't know you could experience the love of God. I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. She offered me prayer and suddenly I just said yes. As she prayed fervently, I felt an incredible sensation on the top of my head, a soft tingling that intensified. I felt as if someone was pouring a vial of oil over my head. The powerful sensation ran all over my body and then surged in power. In retrospect, I believe God was anointing me like Jesus in Isaiah 61 and baptizing me in his Holy Spirit. And at this stage, I started to weep and felt a voice say to me, do you want me? Three times. The third time I said yes. I still didn't know which God this was. (laughs) Then like a breath entering me, I could feel this new life in my soul. I was born again. I heard the Father's voice ask me, will you accept my son Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? I said yes. God poured out his love in my heart and I was overcome with arbitrary tears. This time I felt his power like a heat in my body. I'd become a Christian. Three weeks after the pub moment, I was at Tropfest and my friend's film came up on the screen. As I watched, I looked up to a particular star and prayed to God, if you're real, I need to show me that you exist. If I'm to give it all up, I need you to show me that you exist. He wanted to follow Jesus, but wanted a confirmation. The filmmaker's short film had won the whole competition and I ran down to the red carpet to get an interview with her for the university magazine. She was surrounded by the Australian acting establishment and I called out to her. She turned around and came running over to me with her pineapple trophy in her hand and she said, David, this event is for God's glory. I'm just his servant. There are angels all around this place. God has been reminding me to tell you that he exists. You really need to know that he exists. (laughs) I walked out from Tropfest floating. Jesus was real. He had answered my prayer directly after I'd prayed it. And that Sunday I interviewed her and I attended her Sunday church. As I entered the church, I felt this overwhelming sense of God's presence and I spent the next six months weeping in church services and as the music played, lifting my hands in true worship to God. My whole story (laughs) was littered with undeniable coincidences and God's confirmation. I had met the love I had been searching for all my life. Jesus is God saves. Jesus is God with us. Jesus is Christ in us, the hope of glory. I'm so thankful that that filmmaker, prompted by the Holy Spirit, asked a question. She didn't try and get the wording perfect. She just asked the question, have you ever experienced the love of God? 
could I pray for you? And look at what God did. It's awesome. Why don't we pray together? Lord, I thank you for your word to us this morning. It's a, it's a strong word. It's a, a passionate word. But it's also not a condemning word. It's a life-giving word. That you love us, that you're for us, that you are the hope of the world and you so long to surprise people with your hope. Surprise people with your presence. Surprise people with your goodness. And so, Lord, if we've written people off and thought, you know, they'll never come to God. Over the meal tables and over the coffee shop conversations we're going to have over the next few weeks, Lord, would you help us to be sensitive to the leading of your spirit? Would you help us to just be praying and be open and be listening and be available to you? Because we believe that there's no one, no one, who you don't want to come and know your beautiful, amazing grace. We thank you for what you did in this young man's life. We thank you that even though those desires sometimes haven't gone away, that he's continuing to live as a a celibate single man following Jesus. There's hope available for all of us, Lord. Lord.